We're going to maybe conclude our series today on Samson. We've called this series a very, very enthralling title, The Eight S's of Samson. It's, book, it's found in the book of Judges. And we started about a month ago, and the eight S's, the first S, number one, was the supernatural birth that Samson was born supernaturally. When you get born again, it's a supernatural birth. We just celebrated that today. We talked about supernatural help for Samson's parents. Manoah, Samson's dad, prayed to God, said, God, how do we want to, how can you help us with some wisdom how to raise this child? We talked about how we need to ask God for wisdom for our children. You can have one child that's compliant, and you can have one child that's non-compliant, and they came from the same process, the same people, and yet they're totally different. And God will help you to raise your children. We talked about separation from the world. We talked about a supernatural gift of strength. We talked about Samson was stabbed in the back by his brethren. Unfortunately, that does happen in the body of Christ. There are times people, uh, even, even good brothers, good sisters, because we have a carnal nature, we still have that Adamic nature we're working through, sometimes someone's going to hurt your feelings. And it's not right, and they do it. And yet Samson did not hold that against them and continued to fight for them. And that brings us to today, number six, Samson was seduced by sin. This is one of the more famous stories of the Old Testament, accounts of the Old Testament, Samson and Delilah. Some of you may be old enough to remember listening to the radio. And some of you may listen, they had a program, how, how many remember Casey Kasin? Yeah, well, but there was another one that, that branched off of that, Love Songs with Delilah. Does anybody remember that? And I always used to think, why would anybody name their kid Delilah? Well, I shouldn't say that. There's probably someone in here named Delilah today, and I'm going to have to get in trouble. <laughs> so if you're named Delilah, please forgive me. Just don't be like the biblical Delilah. Our, our younger generation really likes superheroes. Spider-Man, Iron Man, all them people. And one of them, of course, is Superman. I think he was, was Superman the original uh, superhero? Who was the, does anybody know? He, he was the original. And it's been said before, the reason why the world is going so badly is because there's no more phone booths for Superman to change into. <laughs> but Superman had superpowers. He could fly, leap over a tall building, x-ray vision, all sorts of cool things. Well, he had one element that if he was around it, his supernatural power was no longer valid. Who can tell me what that was? Starts with a K. Kryptonite. Everybody knows Superman's anti-power, if you would, was kryptonite. And if there was kryptonite in the region or around him, he couldn't do what he could do. Sin is the kryptonite to a Christian. Let's pick it up in Judges chapter 16, verses 4 through 6. We're going to talk about these three verses. Judges 16, verses 4 through 6. Afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, Delilah was some type of a business person because Delilah had counted the cost of the emotional damage to herself and Samson from this really weird relationship versus 1,100 pieces of silver times every one of those lords that were there and she did the calculator. She said, man or money. And she said, I'll take the money. That's what she did. Now, she began immediately to try 
to get Samson to reveal the source of his strength. And one time Samson was just playing around and he said, well, I'll tell you what, if you, if you weave my hair a certain way, I'll lose my strength. And so she went right to the Philistines and said, this is what you do. They came, they ambushed him, they, they did the thing to his hair, and he still had his strength and he sent them packing with their tails between their legs. Then another time he said, well, if you do this to me, I'll be just like any other man. And she went and told the Philistines, said, hey, this is what you got to do. They did it. They ambushed him. They got their butts kicked. Now, you would think if someone has tried to have you killed twice, it would be time to end the relationship. I, I mean, sometimes I, 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 it's like we don't need Jerry Springer. We don't need Mari. We can just read the Bible. I mean, this is some serious, messed up drama. She doesn't have you, she's, she's putting a hit on you. She's trying to get you killed and you stay with her. Verse 16 tells us she pestered him daily to the point his soul was vexed to death. You know what that means? It means he would, it was the point where he was so tormented by this woman, it's almost like he wanted to kill himself. That's messed up. That tells you people can have control over other people. You know, I, one of the difficult things of, 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 of churches and pastors that we go through is many times we're asked to get involved in some type of a situation where the family is devastated. And many times someone has been manipulated and controlled and, and there's been like this narcissistic relationship and, and we try to get in and help and it, it's like, and even when you begin to bring help, the situation is so bad it takes a long time and a lot of love to get someone back on their feet. I've seen this firsthand. I, I was a child in a, in a relationship like that. Some of the things I saw, you know, when, when, when dad would leave, he had to go leave every week. Um, back, back in the 80s, there was a recession. Um, work was scarce. They had to travel to find work. And when he would go, he would take the car. Well, we had no car. He would take the checkbook with him. Back then, there were no credit cards. We didn't have MasterCard, Visa, Discover. You, there were no debit cards. You had a checkbook or you had cash. And we had no checkbook, and we had no cash, and we had no car. And that's how he kept my mom. You know, remember that old, old thing? What is it? Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater. Had a wife, couldn't keep her, put her in a pumpkin shell. That was him putting her in a pumpkin shell. You know, that, that, I, I, I remember. I mean, and, and there we were. If we missed the bus to school, we had to call people to come take us to school. We had no, no vehicle. You know. and, and, and people live under this. And it, and it took my mom years before she had the confidence to break free out of that kind of relationship. Let me just share this with you. If you know somebody that's in an abusive relationship and they are the victim, they're being controlled, they're being manipulated, it takes a lot to get, because what they think is, if I leave this, I have nothing. I don't have any money. I don't have any say. Uh, they're going to, 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 to trash my name on social media. I won't be able to get a job. They're thinking about all the things that would go wrong if they left that relationship. But ladies and gentlemen, there's sometimes you got to get out of that relationship. And he said, well, pastor, are you telling people they ought to be divorced? There are certain times, yes, they ought to be divorced. And if someone's life is in jeopardy, if someone's soul is being vexed to the point where they would rather die, then yes, that is a relationship they need to get out of. I'll fight you on that one. Amen. There's some, I don't fight on everything. I'll fight, on, I'll fight you on that one. Yeah. But people do this to people. It happens men do it to women, women do it to men. People do it to their children. Children do it to their parents. You know, there's a there's a thing now. I I, I wasn't aware of it till recently. It's called elder abuse. 
where, where there are senior citizens whose children are basically holding them captive to siphon off all the money they possibly can. How, that's disgusting. But in this fallen world, people will seek to dominate other people. Now, I've learned that everybody can put on their Sunday best. Everybody can, when we get to church, we all say we're fine, we're good, we're happy, we got our cologne on, our perfume on, our dress, or whatever, and we're all happy. But then we can go back to home and have a completely different life at home. And if you're here today, and you're the abuser, you're the person that's controlling somebody. You're the person that's controlling them with the threat of violence, with the threat, the threat of smearing them all over social media, or the threat of, of taking the children away, the threat of taking the money away. Repent in the name of Jesus. Don't be that person. You may make it through this life, but you're going to stand before Jesus and you'll have to give an account to why you abused his son or his daughter and he's not going to do well with that with you. I love you enough. Repent now. You can change. I'm a very peaceful Person, I, I, everybody has escape mechanisms, defense mechanisms. Mine is to tell jokes, use my brain. I'm not fast enough to run. <laughs> but very rarely would I ever want to throw hands. But I'll tell you what, I don't take watching a man raise a hand to a woman. Amen. Don't do it, fellas. Young men, you don't have a girlfriend yet. You don't have a wife yet. Hear me. I love you. When you get you one, you make her the queen. And you, wanna, you want things to go well with you, learn these two words. Yes, dear. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, fellas. Marriage, family, it's going to give you pressure that sometimes is bigger than you. And not because of anything they're doing wrong, just because life can be tough. And when it does, lesser men turn to violence or alcohol or substance or other women. They turn to things to try to relieve the pressure. You don't need that. Be a man. Real manhood is Christ-likeness. Real manhood is treating your wife well, treating your children well. Real manhood is not raising your voice. Real manhood is not hitting the wall. Real manhood is not showing threats of violence. Real womanhood is not nagging your husband to the point he'd rather die. <laughs> this is one of my favorite illustrations that, that bears repeating. But just, you know, if you remember, ladies, you used to pray for a husband. And you used to pray for kids. Remember that? Remember when you used to pray for all that? Lord, please, Lord. I, I mean, I got, I got daughters, you know. They're like, oh, Lord. And I know how it is. You, 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 uh, every time you meet a cute boy, you're thinking, how does my name sound next to his, you know? <laughs> well, God answers your prayer. So don't spend the rest of your life complaining about it. Uh, you're doing laundry. Bless God, these kids, they don't appreciate me. They, they, oh, bless God, they don't clean up after. Well, duh. I've, the, there's a reason why Mother's Day is so popular. Because we know we're a bunch of imbeciles. And you're the best thing that God ever did for us. We know that. We don't fight you on that. What do you want? <laughs> we'll give it to you. But let's learn from Samson. Don't stay in a relationship that makes you want to kill yourself. Amen. And dear Lord, if you're single today and you start dating Whatever you do, you call it talking, whatever. 
and you start seeing yellow flags or red flags, run. They don't go away once you put the ring on. Once you put the ring on, the real crazy comes out. Love is blind. Marriage is an eye opener. Man, make sure, guys, you see her without makeup at least once before you get married. <laughs> Ladies, just make sure you imagine his chest falling into his drawers. <laughs> Don't marry him for his butt. If you do, just know it's going to get bigger. <laughs> oh, I thought, his little, I thought her butterfly tattoo was cute. Well, by the time she's 50, it's going to be a pterodactyl. So, so don't marry for all that stuff because it's going to change. <laughs> but you know, if you get anything out of this today, when you go home today, I hope you'll really affirm. So you know what? We're not going to have a Samson-Delilah relationship. We're going to treat you the way you need to be treated. We're not going to have some Jerry Springer theme in the background. I'm going to love her like Christ loves the church. She's going to respect me as the head of the house. And we're going to get along happily ever after. And we're not going to complain and tear one another down. We're going to use everything we got to build each other up. Amen. Uh, finally, Delilah wears him down. We'll pick it up in verse 18. Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart. She sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. She lulled him to sleep on her knees, called for a man, and had him shave off the seven locks off his head. And she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon us, you Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. Once again, sin is kryptonite. Samson was not the first. He wasn't the last. But the Bible gives us these warnings and these, these teachings to learn from them so we don't have to repeat the same mistakes. Moses had a temper problem, and it cost him. Moses, uh, when he saw an Egyptian beating one of his Hebrew Brethren, he lost his temper. You don't kill a man with bare hands without having some type of rage issue. Then later on down the road, Moses gets mad at the people because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And God had given him these two tablets of stone. I mean, that's pretty cool stuff. Moses got ticked and he took those tablets and he broke them. That's temper. And then later in life, they're almost have completed the journey across the wilderness, and they come to a dry spot, they need some water, and in the past, what God had had Moses do to produce water was take his staff and strike a rock, and that rock would split and water would come up. Well, Moses is angry. Moses is having some issues, he's, he's, he's mad at the people, he's a little ticked, you know, God's made me work this hard all my whole life. I'm 119, 120 years old. I'd like to have a vacation. And, and God says, okay, Moses, I want you to speak to the rock. And instead of speaking to the rock, Moses took the staff and out of a temper hit the rock. And God said, Moses, you've crossed the line. I can't let you go into the promised land. Now, I realize to whom much is given, much is required. And the greater proximity we come to God the quicker our judgment is, the more severe our punishment is. So, well, why would anybody want to come to God? Well, being with God is much greater than being without God. Abraham had a problem with lying. And although Abraham was able to over, overcome the consequences, he inadvertently passed it on to his son Isaac. You see, ladies and gentlemen, our kryptonite, if we're not careful, we pass it on to our children. You see, you can teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. It's hard to tell your kids with a cigarette in your hand, don't smoke. 
Now, you should still tell them, if you're a smoker, tell them, don't smoke. Hope They'll believe you, but sometimes they're going to reproduce what you do, not what you say. That's why the Bible tells us to train up a child, not to teach a child. Teach is to talk. Train is to demonstrate. Jonah had an attitude problem. He was miserable his entire life. Lot had multiple personality flaws that cost him everything. When we're trying to teach about sin, it's not that we're trying to kill all the fun in your life and get you to be some type of morally pious person, get you to become a priest that wears a robe or to become a nun or anything like that. I'm not trying to get you to do any of that. I'm simply saying, you know what? There is a better way. Delilah was not the first issue for Samson. Samson started off much younger, and he married the wrong woman. His parents said, I don't like this girl. She's not the right type for you, Samson. And Samson said, yeah, but I like her. She's so pretty. And she was pretty. But I'll tell you what, that first marriage he had it was worse than Jerry Springer and Mari combined. I mean, if you go back and read the account, he married her. His fam- her family didn't like him. His family didn't like her. Ladies and gentlemen, your, your in-laws matter. All right? In-laws do matter. It's a package deal. None of them liked anybody. And this woman is just crying the whole time, nagging Samson. <laughs> She doesn't let up. Well, ends up, they ended up separated. And you know who moved in on her? His best friend, his best man at his wedding is now married to her. And Samson, I mean, that, that cry, he really loved her. And he put up with a lot, and he ended up losing her to his best friend. And by the time it's all said and done, that whole family gets killed. It was ugly. I mean, it was ugly. It was like Jerry Springer meets the mob. (laughs) Then he ends up with a prostitute. And he tries to have a relationship with a prostitute. Ladies and gentlemen, prostitutes don't make very good companions. That's probably, if if you're single today, and you're thinking, I would like to be married someday, I'm going to recommend that you don't start with a prostitute. I know it worked for Richard Gere and Pretty Woman, but that was a movie. (laughs) But the thing is, he didn't learn from the first one. He didn't learn from the second one. And he ends up with a third one who is just as bad, if not worse. And she has so much control over him. You see, if you don't know who you are, Someone can control you. It's so important. You know, I know it's just another Sunday for you. It's just Sunday. We go to church. We're going to go eat. We got this stuff we're going to do today. We're going to go see mom. Go do this. Work in the yard. If it stops raining, that's all wonderful things. But every time you come, you're learning who you are. You're learning what Jesus says about you. You're learning his calling and purpose on your life. And see, when you know who you are, you're not going to let somebody else abuse you. You're not going to let someone else sell you out. And I want to encourage you today. We have to learn to deal with sin before sin deals with us. Sin, the Greek word is pega, simply means to miss the mark like an archer target. Like, I'll tell you, I had some, I, I went deer hunting this year. I only, I only had one day on my schedule that allowed me to do it. I wasn't able to, pray. I'm not a very good deer hunter, I'll just tell you. You know, I'm just not very stealthy, all right? <laughs> when you're six foot seven, there's just certain things you're not naturally going to be good at, all right? You know, I probably wouldn't be a very good the guy at pickpocket, you know? Well, I bump into somebody and knocks them all the way down. <laughs> well, I went deer hunting, and man... I had some, I got right on a good spot. And I, I'm telling you what, what, Jesse was there, you were there. And, and man, the deer came. I'm like, oh, yeah. And all of a sudden, I'm like, meat on the table, summer sausage, deer jerky, 
I'm so excited. And they start moving in. And the whole time I'm thinking, well, what if they run away? And the guy beside me is saying, wait, wait. I don't want to wait. You might run away. So I pull out my bow, and I shoot, and I miss, and all the deer run away. And now you know I'm not a very good deer hunter. That's what sin is. You miss. You miss the target. Did I feel bad after? Oh, yeah, I felt terrible. Man, I'm telling you, you go from emotionally up here to feel like, man, my family would starve if we were back in the old days. We'd have to become vegetarians. Sin means to miss the mark. John, John Wesley asked his mom when he was a child, he said, what's sin, mom? She said this, she said, whatever weakens your reason. Yeah, we got it up there. Whatever increases the authority of your body over your mind. Whatever impairs the tenderness of your conscience. Whatever takes away your relish for things spiritual. Whatever obscures your sense of God, that is sin to you, no matter how innocent it may seem in itself. It's not that God's trying to kill your joy. There is pleasure in sin. The Bible even says in Hebrews chapter 11, it says there is a passing pleasure of sin. God does not hide that. But God also tells us, and we see firsthand in some cases, that the consequences of sin are greater than the pleasure of sin. And as a result, number seven, Samson's strength was sapped. Verse 20 says he did not know that his strength had departed. Sin blinds us to the truth in our own lives we think we're invincible. We think we can handle it. We think we can quit anytime we want. And for a while we can, but there comes a point you can't. As Christians, we need our strength. The devil is not some hippie peace child that just wants to live and let live. The devil is your adversary who comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. And maybe you don't need it today, maybe you don't need it tomorrow, but there is going to come a point in your life you need to have the strength of God on the inside of you. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes there is a time for peace, but it also says there is a time for war. There is a time to refrain and a time to fight. And I, don't, I, I hope that none of you ever have to fight for your life, but there is a chance... Ladies and gentlemen, cancer wants to come knocking at your door. Heart disease wants to come knocking at your door. There's a chance family drama wants to come knocking at your door. Addiction wants to come knocking at your door. All those things. And we need to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might so we can resist the devil and he will flee. Philistines are not a new concept. The Bible says when trouble comes, not if trouble comes. And the Bible says in Proverbs 24, 10, it says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. You know, the size of the problem is not the problem. It's the strength of the person that has the problem determines how big the problem is. I've seen people get a stubbed toe and think the world's going to end. I've seen people with quadruple bypass open heart surgery acting like it's just another day. You see, the strength that you carry determines how big or small the problem is when it happens to you. you know, I, 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 I just realized it was 20 years ago this year is when I started selling cars and, and learning so much. And I remember uh, 2003, there's this, this man came to the dealership and he, was, he came up in a BMW 5 Series, brand new Beamer. And, and, and it came up, and we're just a Toyota dealer. And, and it came in, and I was talking to him. I said, what can I help you with? He said, well, I'm this XYZ title at this big company, and this is my company car. I just got let go. And 
he went from being up at the top and everything he owned was financed, everything he owned was, it was all keeping up with the Joneses. And when he let, got let go, he went from up here to down really quick. Does anybody remember the recession we went through in about 2008, 2009, and so many people lost their jobs? You see, people act real tough when everything's going right. But when stuff gets difficult, we find out what they're really made of. When it comes to sin, I, I, I've, this is my favorite illustration. I've given this ever since I was a youth pastor back in 1995, and it still rings true to this day. But how many of y'all been fishing so far? Anybody fishing here yet? A few of you? I have not, but I've thought about it. As soon as I get a free day, I'll get any, any good rednecks here go night fishing for catfish? Any, any good rednecks here? Alex, Chip, all right. Down there, all right. Just, it's just a redneck. It's, I don't know. It's just like I feel so at home with my previous redneck ancestors <laughs> when I'm fishing for catfish at night. And the way you fish for catfish is you put this nasty, stinky bait on the end of it which we think is nasty, stinky. The catfish thinks, oh, man, this is so good. This is like mama's apple pie. And we just throw that stink bait out there 50 feet or so off the shore, and you, you, you leave your, the, your reel of your fishing pole open so it can take line out. And the catfish comes feeding by smell, smells it, picks it up in its lips, and begins to swim away. And the whole time you see the line begin to move off your pole. And the, the discipline is you let the fish continue to swim. Because as that fish is swimming off, it's taking that bait from the front part of its mouth to the back part of its mouth to eventually swallow the bait. And the key is just let them, let them swim. You're, run, baby, run, run, run. And that catfish takes off. He thinks, oh, man, I've got me a meal. And after about... 20 seconds, 30 seconds, you simply just close your reel so the line no longer lets any out. The catfish pulls it tight, and you just go, bam, and jerk that hook so it sets it in its jaw. And then you say, like every good redneck, meat on the table. And you reel it in. Eating good tonight. Fried catfish and coleslaw. Praise God. Well, that's how sin operates. The devil puts it out there. It's appealing. It's, it's, we think it's great. We start running with it. Nothing bad happens. And we just start swallowing it deeper and deeper and deeper. And when the, before long, the devil just <coughs> pops the hook. And we're set. Now we're caught. That's how it works. I'm not telling you all this to make you some religious, pious holier-than-thou person. You cannot get to heaven simply by good works and being without sin. Only through Jesus Christ can we get to heaven. I'm trying to help you to be a witness for Christ on earth to accomplish your potential and to be holy for God is holy. And lastly of this series, Samson did receive a second chance. Our God is the God of the second chance, the third chance, the fifth chance, the hundredth chance, the ten thousandth chance. His mercy is new every day. Love covers a multitude of sins. He's the God of the right side of the tracks, but he's also the God of the wrong side of the tracks. Samson, at the end, he's blind. They've plucked out his eyes. He's a slave pushing a wheel all day long. And the Philistines are having a party, a religious festival, and they bring Samson in that they can look at him and make fun of him and mock him. And Samson prays this prayer. He says, Lord, one more time that I might have my strength. 
The promises of God are yes and amen. If you've ever strayed as the prodigal child, God is married to the backslider. Even today, some had testified, I, I was baptized as a child. I strayed and I came back. God was there. He takes the record of your sin and throws it as far as the east is from the west. And then he has the audacity in Romans chapter 8 verse 1 to say, There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. If you ever feel condemned, it did not come from Jesus. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Mercy triumphs over judgment. But let me ask you this question. What if Samson did not limit God to one more time? What if he said, restore my strength? Do you think that God was good for more than one more time? I want you to understand, don't limit God based on your limitations. God is above your ability to comprehend and to think. And I'm glad that he asked for one more time. I'm glad he got one more time. And it was the best time of all. But what if he would have said, God, restore me that I might have a life and find love and live out my purpose as the judge I've been called to live? You think maybe God could have answered that prayer? Yeah. Now, it might have been that Samson was saying, you know what, I've had so much of this life. I'm done. I want to do one more thing for God. I'm ready to just walk and be with God. You know, I, I, I've met with many people as they approach the end of their life. I said, what are you believing for? Many of them say, Pastor, just pray I'm ready to go. Pray that I go peacefully. Pray, pray I go without pain. That's a hard prayer to pray, but we pray that prayer. And God honors that prayer. But there are many who say, Pastor, I want to live and not die. And we pray the prayer of faith. Amen. And lastly, God is faithful. God is here as the God of reconciliation, the God of restoration, of mercy, forgiveness, and grace. He's here that you cannot out sin what God can forgive. I'm not here to beat you up just to make you feel bad because you've sinned. But just as a loving parent, when I see my children do something foolish, I want to correct them because I don't want them to have to eat the seed that they're sowing, the fruit of the seed that they're sowing. And as a pastor, one of the most difficult things is when you see somebody who you love and their heart just sometimes leads them astray. And sometimes you see people get back involved in sin. They, get back, they fall back into an addiction. They fall back into something. And it grieves you. And we're not judging that person at all. We're not saying, oh, shame. There's no shame. It's just you know and everybody knows there's so much greater purpose and anointing and blessing for your life than what you're running back to. How do you deal with sin in your life? The Bible says repent, which means turn around. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says it like this, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. There needs to be an understanding that sin is wrong and hurtful to God. Godly sorrow is not just sorry you got caught Godly sorrow is when we realize we've offended God, we've hurt God, we've hurt ourselves, we've compromised our witness, we've compromised our strength, and we don't want to be in a compromised position. We will find that God is rich in mercy. We will set the restoration process in motion with our repentance. Some churches, and I'm not against this at all, they 
they would make an appeal. If, this, if you're in sin, come down to the altar. And I, I, I've been a part of churches like that, and, and we've done that here. I don't feel like that's what we need to do today for everybody. But I'm going to close the service, and when I dismiss, if you feel like you need to come down up front and pray and just give some time to God and give some things to God and, 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 and get your heart right with God. <laughs> but you see, here's the thing. <clears throat> You feel good on Sunday. Man, you're here this morning. You, you're surrounded by 500 people, however many people here, that love you, that are praying for you, that are believing God for you. But tomorrow is when, when the rubber meets the road. Amen. I want you to set up an altar at home. I, I'll tell you what, I, I want you to have a place at home where you meet with God. I want you to have a place, whether it's your, a certain chair, a certain closet, out on the porch, Whatever it might be for you, you need to have a place at home where you can go and know that there you're going to encounter God. And my challenge to you today is if I was teaching, you say, Pastor, yep, that's me. I, I, I'm all for bringing you down, dumping some oil on your head, anointing you, slapping you, whatever we got to do. But I feel today to tell you, you need to find a place at home when you're not limited by time because godly sorrow takes more than three minutes. Godly sorrow takes more than me bopping you on the head. Godly sorrow, you know, for those of you who've had some marriage problems, you've had some ups and downs in your marriage and you've had those fights that lasted three to five days or three to five years. You, you don't, come out of a major argument and, oh, I'm sorry, and then everything's just hunky-dory. Takes a little bit more than just, I'm sorry. I just called you and your mama every name in the book, and I didn't come home for dinner when I was supposed to come home, and I, I, I did this and I did that. I'm sorry, let's move on like it never happened. It takes time. And I believe today, as, as you go, would you purpose in your heart today to seek the Lord? And if there's been something that said, Pastor, i got to deal with it. Guys, I, I, I'm not trying to be super spiritual here. But men, if there's a temper issue, we got to deal with it. Men, look, don't, don't come up here. You, you don't have to come tell the whole world. But if you need to talk to someone, talk to someone. But... Man, if you've been hitting the wall, if you've been close to hitting your wife or your children in an unholy way, you got to get help. No more. No more in Jesus' name. If you, if you went, if, if you're, you've got some addiction, I'm all for all the recovery programs, but ladies and gentlemen, one of the greatest recovery programs is godly sorrow. And just getting before God and being honest, God, I don't want to do this anymore. God, and stay in your prayer closet until you're changed. Ladies, you've been using your mouth. You've been, you've been going into hyper worry, hyper doubt. I don't know. You've been bitter toward your husband, bitter toward your children. Let it go. Deal with it today. Find your prayer closet. Maybe, maybe you're bitter at, 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 I don't know, somebody in the church. I don't know what it is, but ladies and gentlemen, Get rid of the kryptonite because God's called you to be super. I'm going to leave you with that. I hope you feel and hear how much we love you. I, I, we don't get to hang out. I mean, you know, a congregation this size, I don't get to go out to dinner with you every day or every week. I want you to know there's never an hour that goes by that I'm awake that I'm not thinking about you and praying for you and I want the very best in your life amen and Andrea and I's life stands to testify that we can serve God long term we don't have to get caught up in sin we can burn hot for God for decades. Amen. 
I hope you feel that today and hear that coming from me today. I hope you hear that in my heart, how much we love you. Let's pray. Father, as we've talked about sin today, we're thankful for Jesus Christ who took all the sin of the world on the cross. And as we go our separate directions, I pray there to be a great grace upon us to come before you in our individual lives to repent of our sins, to have godly sorrow, to allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us, to clean us up. Lord, I bless these families, their finances, their health, their relationships, their work. And Lord, as we go, I pray that our lives would burn bright for Jesus Christ, that we would be a witness for him everywhere we go. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. I'll be out shaking hands out there. We're dismissed.